change the translation yet of this? No. It's yeah. on, well, I'm not sure there will be. Yeah. Um, it's on title tense and relevance, and as you'll see, relevance theory is an important uh, part of uh, the methodology of the theoretical framework that it uses. Uh, there are three co edited volumes on discourse and structures. Again, I think that that's in French. But there is a 2005 volume in English um, on the subject dear to the hearts of CDA people. And they are called Manipulation and Ideologies in the 20th Century. Uh, and uh, he also has a, a book about us here in French, and Paul Vigasse, Sidon Saussure. Um, probably won't surprise you to hear that he's written on the Mount of Carver, and in this case, it's very well for Saussure. The Perspectives of Saussure. I don't know that book. I mean, the title one day. Um, so, you can see uh, Louis' research is is totally rooted in uh, theoretical perspectives, not only, not only the French speaking European language, also, there's a very strong cognitive element which comes from. Uh, uh, recently, Anglo Saxon work, and in particular, uh, relevance theory. Um, but also, he's not pure theorist, very much engaged in uh, uh, practical um, commentary on real social life and is involved in uh, commentary on um, political, political and social issues uh, in the media and the United Nations organization. Also, with um, questions of intercultural communication. Well, I hand over to Thank you very much. Does it work? Yeah, I think so. Um, we had two very, very dense days, so um, I talk about a relaxing story now rather than a, a very dense presentation again. Um, well, First of, all, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me, Paul, and um, inviting me means inviting a linguist, so I will, of course, talk a little bit about linguistics today, but not that kind of old-fashioned syntactic things, rather uh, pragmatics, which is, as you all uh, know, um, uh, the domain of, of linguistics that's interested in to meaning and meaning construction. Right. Well, um, let me start by let me start by a little story. Um, maybe you know about this huge conference that happens two years called the IPRA conference or the conference of the International Pragmatics Association. The last conference that's IPRA conference took place in London, Italy. And well it's that kind of huge conference with where you meet with probably thousands of people, hundreds of papers are presented, all under that global name of pragmatics. And that's the place where pragmaticists and, uh, say, his personalists are supposed to meet. However, if you have been there already, and I guess you have, some of you at least, you have noticed that sort of invisible fence between uh, say two kinds of people there, two communities, right? Two scientific communities there. Um, as a sort of a caricature, I named these two um, communities, the Grunchian people and the Austinian people. Of course, this is very caricatural. It's just the idea that um, lots of people are dealing with the, um, let's say, the inheritance of Austinian speech as an action, discourse has been best tackled through um, theory of action, psychosocial theory of action, and it's probably where you will find most of discourse analysts there. Um, then on the other side, what I call question, um, certainly too short as a label, and you will find people coming from semantics, lots of philosophy of language, philosophers of language, formalists, computationalists, and all that kind of guys, and of course also um, most uh, so-called cognitive pragmatists, uh, reverse theory people, right? But the image I chose is an image that shows that here you would have the 
uh, Austinian persons and the, the Gracian, but certainly they would not talk to each other except to exchange insults, all right, and, and what? So I think that's a problem, uh, because we're all supposed to be pragmatists or discourse analysts. Uh, what are the reasons for this sort of mutual ignorance? Um, well, this epistemological defense has its grounds, of course. And, um, well, on each side of the fence, you will have different answers to different questions. The main question, probably, the main, uh, the main idea on one side is to address this course as shaped by and shaping uh, social activities, social realities, right? And therefore, uh, these courses are documents, reliable documents for um, behavior, um, and social studies in uh, general, right? Uh, on the other side, people would prefer to address this course as a sort of byproduct of human cognitive abilities to communicate, to exchange information um, dynamically. Well, that is also a loaded word. Uh, maybe have a minute to talk about dynamicity. Right? But therefore, these people would prefer to anchor on an ideology which is better grounded on, which is grounded on, or inspired by um, natural sciences, or hard science, logic, this kind of things. Um, right. The problem, to my opinion, is that both viewpoints, well, um, are true or valid in their own domain of research, but of course they oppose on the methodological and epistemological sides. Let's generally consider discourses as poles, as units, um, static, I would say, <coughs> unfinished entities. Well, CDA, for example, to a certain extent, does this, considers discourses and tries to tackle the um, underlying structure, this kind of thing, right? Other theories, of course, do this. Uh, Reverical structure theory does that. Um, argumentation theory, pragma dialectics. Theory and all modular approaches to discourses inspired by the words of Kaufman when they come down to examine some text span, for example, right? Of course, some other type of discourse analysts do things completely differently from the formal side, with formal semantics, blah, blah, blah. We'll talk about this. Now, what are um, cognitive pragmatists? Uh, doing, they were considering, they will consider discourses as dynamic processes. Um, this is a case for relevance theory, but also for um, theory of semantic default by Cassia Yashol in Cambridge, for example. It's true also for Rebonetti's truth conditional mathematics. It's true for psycholinguistics, by the way, as well. And psycholinguistics, which was um, for a long time dedicated to uh, the level of sentence, now is interested more and more into differential process and sort of meeting cognitive pragmatics in an interesting way. Um, going further to the reasons for um, mutual, mutual ignorance, if not dogmatic hate in the community, probably it's because we have a different object of studies on both parts of the fence. Um, on the first side, this course uh, as, uh, are considered as um, documents for psychosocial human activity studies, um, and the input of this analysis, which is discourse analysis, right, is already interpreted, uh, already meaningful sentences, I would say, mm -hmm. already meaningful sets of utterances. The question is not exactly what does this guy mean here exactly. We take this as an input, and we see the structure and the way this particular meaningful sentence does with the whole discourse we are considering. The result of this analysis is supposed to be the spelling out um, of the underlying articulation, preparation of the given discourse, its persuasive structure and how it, it integrates within global, more global social structures and so on. While on the other side, people who consider discourses as communicative and informative processes take as an input of the analysis non-meaningful spans of, of bits of uh, language. Well, 
they, um, they need a single semantic or even syntactic structure, and then they try to explain how these um, sort of microstructures extend to full meaning, to meaningful utterances. The question is, of course, whether these approaches can extend to address something we could call discourse meaning, right? Both sides face problems, of course. The first side faces the problem of accounting how meaning is constructed. Uh, while I consider that it is central, although other people may think differently or have other definitions of meaning, as you probably noticed from uh, another plenary talk. Um, and how um, even non-intended information can be recovered starting from some linguistic stream in some given context. Right. Now the problem for pragmatics on its side is that <clears throat> it's uh, very difficult for pragmatics to account for what discourse is and how a discourse works. Since we, I mean, pragmatics is basically, basically about a single utterance. So how do you come to um, upper level of sets of academic tools that concern utterances, right? Even some pragmatists would say that does not exist. A little disclaimer here, this, um, we all say this disclaimers, this uh, Anglo-Saxon probably where everywhere you go there's a disclaimer. Um, so um, my turn to do this again. Um, it's of course not that simple. Right? It's, still, it's this disclaimer about my caricature, right? Um, Meaning construction, in particular, implicit means such as indirect speech acts, implicatures, all these are indeed integrated to some extent in many discourse analysis approaches. Generally, the discourse analysis doesn't provide clear explanation of how this meaning is achieved and built and constructed. Um, besides, well, of course, some. Uh, classical link, uh, some con conventional linkage between types of information that we typically, typically insert in accounts of um, implicit speech acts, recovery, things like that, indirect speech acts. But of course, also on the other side, discourses as units, as wholes, um, are also considered in many formal approaches, in many semantic, dynamic semantic approaches, we can call themselves, such like. Um, discourse representation theory or discourse representation theory is uh, works um, on well logical theories about semantic how to extend all semantics to the level of rhetorical relations and things like that. But the problem with that with these approaches is that actually the output side does not inform us very much about the meaning of the whole thing. That's a problem, a typical problem for semantics. Um, how do you go further about meaning? Um, okay, a little, little summary, just not to go too far, right? <laughs> Since we're all tired, including myself. Um, discourses as wholes, discourses as processes. So discourses as wholes, uh, discourses as structures of actions, rituals maybe, arguments. There exist laws of coherence, generally in this in discourse analysis approaches. Uh, the problem of coherence is a very disputed one. There, uh, there is often a postulation of um, something like social determinism, which means that the environment and the context uh, sort of determines the speech for that act, speech act, uh, at least to some extent, right? Um, and uh, there's a goal for generally present, not always, but generally present, which is to free somehow individuals from their dependency toward discourses. Or did this be? I don't know. Yeah, uh, let me skip on the last point. Now on the other side, discourse as processes. Discourse asks uh, people uh, to produce sequential change of the hero mental state, step by step, utterance after utterance. Uh, that parts of discourse are unfolding secretly the force being available in salient context are going to be processed. Now, discourse and communication in this view is a matter of individual cognitions 
exchanging information. And of course, you realize that this is a, a sensitive point since um, what I talk about will cost, right? And how you can, how can you make um, or build a gap, a bridge a gap between individual and patients? It's always uh, actually it's probably the central point, uh, central problem. Right? And it's the like points that they would uh, say to each well, they would say that uh, the Austinian guy would say that cognitive approaches are a regression because it's focused individual cognition or social cognition. That sometimes they would say that meaning this that I've heard of really um astonished I was talking recently. Um, um, sometimes they would even say that uh, reality does not exist. Um, that's a sensitive issue, so top session, right? Um, that's not that actually. Syntax is a for discourse analysis. Like formalization won't take us anywhere. Okay, straightforward thoughts or arguments on the other side would say, be like this. Fuzzy or this existence only an utterance, which is also an uh, assumption, right? Um, social doubt that uh, where to uh, come a little bit into the process of falling through because I would be keen to show you if you think of it in these ways, in these terms. So this idea relies on a few principles of, well, that uh, is reductible to understand to that discourse is interpreted when the last utterance is interpreted because you have an original mental state and the state of the mental state is a sort of like the change in the mental state from the beginning to the end of a discourse, and that would be the best explanation. Well, so sending off to linguistic proper, I would say, you've got the interpretation of the, and then um, the semantic form, which I kind of didn't mention there, then, well, the propositional form, implicit meaning, so um, about various levels of, we could add something there, such as, something, right? <coughs> Linguists work with a modal, um, take a semantic of and here the model which is uh, well used with relevance theory, it's never been worse since relevance theory, but the logical form of the proposition uh, with reference assignments, what are we talking about, what are the objects that are presented in this specific logical device. Um, I said that this is a model that is to be abandoned. Um, let me try to um, maybe come a little bit more. Um, I've shared by a number of scholars. Actually, people, and that seems to be shown more and more by daytime studies in psycholinguistics, spend differences and then uh, implicate it uh, very well that all this goes very uh, in a parallel way with exchange of information, various levels of representation, the syntactic form, and um, with the semantic form, and with the uh, um, propositional form and possible implicit meaning altogether. Uh, when complex process and uh, examples to show that we can't stand exactly only approach it um, posture as a model at least. If you take this uh, not exactly a timeline but rather different <coughs> levels of representation that may be clearer, um, the yes, that's to derive meaning logical forms and context is integrated quite early. I personally would even add contextual information on the very beginning following also works on psycholinguistics, early division and these kind of things. Why am I talking about this? Whether we could do something like something like uh, discourse, discourse assumption, assumptions or discursive level of representation. Yeah. Uh, when I'm processing an utterance within a discourse, of course I'm probably speculating things about the global there's probably something that pragmatists should add there and that's why discourse analysis is interesting to pragmatists, but the problem of interfacing, of course, is very sensitive. Okay. Uh, just a word about relevance theory, uh, which relies on a set of, of principles, just state a few. The central uh, idea that's been put forward, um, which we can discuss story, um, it's, it's very simple to expect a complicated story, uh, it's that principle of relevance, right? sort of a maxim or so. You know, search for the thing for which the effects of saying, in particular, the calculation of meaning, right? So, this, for, so I will skip this. They have good thing that is something like this happening 
um, with the utterance into being in particular. Um, now, that differently. Uh, discourse analysis generally takes as already read into material. Uh, we generally don't worry whether uh, and so on. We, discourse analysis we generally take uh, addresses or utterance without really worrying. In actual examples before it, but uh, in everyday conversation, of course, we end in terms to read quite a lot of the information from the place and how that, in order to have, you know, discourse analysis on something that provides the, provides the input for discourse analysis, which is something like a pragmatic theory, right? So let's have a look at a few examples. If you say max, uh, then of course it's too small for something, right? So the for something is not linguistically ex um, stated in such uh, natural words, but it is part of the actual content. Right? So discourses are not discourses in bits of linguistic information, in terms of texts, but of course it's the linguistic information plus is necessarily derived from this linguistic information, even at the level of something very semantic like this, same for animal is better, of course, better than what um, type semantic there that requires just unarticulated but well provided by the context. Now there's a dispute about it's raining, whether, uh, well the question if you say it's raining, this contains what they call a hidden indexical, such as here or now. Now, um, there's a, uh, François Ricanati is, I heard, writing a paper just called It's Raining Somewhere and just to um, just uh, attack this class view that you have hidden in lexicals and such sentences. Right. Um, another example is you say everybody likes a carbonara and it might mean everybody likes pasta and carbonara in the family, right, what you have to um, of your assertion, right? Uh, the mountain, this is very, uh, well, uh, you can have complex enrichment. Complex. Why complex? Because the theory, when it comes down to these kind of phenomena, is not that simple to um, manage. And as for children, that's a classical example of the maxims. But this is quite a fortune. This is a logical problem here that you certainly don't read about. Um, I don't eat frog legs. Uh, I never eat frog legs, right? Um, interesting thing, I married after a husband of course, and then stab the husband. And it's really a huge problem. Linguists, uh, pragmatists, and semanticists are fighting together uh, in order to know what's that end that expands into. And it's a very compli complicated, very complicated thing. Um, what about Holland? This is a nice example to show that sometimes you don't need to get more precise with the conceptual information that you have. Also, if you say Holland is flat, but Holland is literally flat, of course, the table is flat, right? So you mean that Holland has little, how do you say that, well, yes, well, I understand what I mean. Um, but this is interesting because a thing like Holland is flat could be understood as, you know, a violation of semantic property, flat, right? If flat means flat then it's sort of non-literal flatness. But if it's non-literal flatness, is it metaphorical flatness? I mean, generally we have those very clear cut as metaphorical. Fine, let's go with that. But what about Holland is flat? Oh, what about Federer in the new Sempras? Bush is Bush is a nice one because it's a tautology. Of course, but you can use it as I will uh, just, I will talk a little bit about Bush and Bush in a minute. Next slide, um, it's a tautology, and as all tautology, you need to expand them, right? And to see what kind of intended meaning there is with think bush is bush, or a boy is a boy, if a girlfriend says uh, to, uh, to uh, her, if a girl says to her girlfriend, uh, her boyfriend, oh, uh, complicated, about her boyfriend who left her, oh, you know, a boy is a boy, that's already, uh, about probably masculine violence or whatever. Um, okay. Um, now, <laughs> what about these non-informative statements like a boy is a boy or bush is bush? Um, lots of them appear in political bias discourses for a very interesting reason, I 
going to try to tackle a little bit of that. Um, an example, it's an example that's just burdened up, but there's a classical example that was exactly like this in speeches by the sort of a more um, actualized or uh, kind of. Well, I don't need to tell you why we invaded Iraq. You know it's already, right? This is not informative as a justification for the first clause. Right? So just look for why we invaded Iraq and you'll find a solution and I assume that you know it so you must know it and you don't have the sort of right not to know it. It's a classical thing. But let's try to go a little bit closer to these tautologies. Um, like Bush is Bush. Um, Bush is Bush is an interesting statement since it can support anything about Bush, of course. Because Bush is Bush, right? I vote Bush because Bush is Bush. Or I don't vote Bush because Bush is Bush, right? So this kind of statement um, is, of course, enriched. Uh, well, the question is exactly whether these statements are actually enriched pragmatically in Kant, or in fact, uh, no. Um, <clears throat> well, um, of course, there may be some actual content of pragmatic enrichment of sentences like Bush is Bush. Like, for example, um, Bush has these very properties that define him, uh, define his personality, define his policy and action and are uh, mutually manifest to the speaker and the hearer and that sort of, okay, a sort of standard enrichment like, I like pasta carbonara because pasta carbonara is pasta carbonara, you know this thing, and you know that I love cream and I love whatever. Yeah, that's not a real problem, but there is no clear reason or no clear evidence to think that such a content is serious. Uh, there are good cognitive reasons, in fact, um, to think that this kind of argument can be so, so to say, shallow process of some work from colleagues and Rodman's theory who sort of opened that little idea without going very far with it, but there's an interesting thing there. The idea is that you take the argument and you accept it without even considering any meaningful prob problematical level of meaning and without even filling up the empty slots there, so to say, right? Um, yeah, so this is an interesting thing um, that relates to what is sometimes called pragmatic illusions, that we, we sometimes have these illusions of meaning uh, with these illusions of meaning while it's just empty or not correct or misused or whatever goes uh, with jokes. If I tell that story, <clears throat> the plane crashed uh, on the a French border with Italy, and you ask the person, where do you think we burned the Bibles? And the classical story, it's a classical story because generally the person wonders whether that will be France or Italy or right on the border or in, in, the, in their home countries or whatever, but never sees or rare or rare sees that is a problem with survivor and burying, right? So there's sort of an extraction of a very basic property of survivor there, which is just human being, probably. Um, so the problem in the semantic form there is sort of overcome uh, through contextual information that pushes into it. Right. Uh, lots of other pragmatic problems in our vision, like presuppositional assertion. Well, um, I thought this morning to add propositional assertion and I was sort of in pain of finding novels. So I thought about this one, where it's not, maybe not completely convincing, but suppose you have to, to go with your child to Aunt Mary's and Aunt Mary, well, the child really doesn't like her. Uh, if you, so you must sort of set up a strategy to convince him not to cry a lot about the story of going to Aunt Mary's. And so what kind of strategies can you adopt? If you say, do you want to go, or we are going to, maybe that will be a problem. But, you, but well, maybe, I take some precautions there. Uh, maybe if you take the presuppositional assertion, the sort of manipulating the child there, you might decrease the risk of another which teddy bear do you want to take at Aunt Mary's. Yeah, for example. 
And uh, the attention will focus, of course, on the teddy bear, not on the preposition, not on the presupposed content. Right? It's a classical problem in semantics and pragmatics that you normally don't share references over uh, proper contents, right? But actually, presupposed contents can be sort of present in the sentence, but sometimes they're sort of absent. Uh, it's sort of hard to track back. Um, well, for example, if you say uh, Iraqi or Iraqi, did you say that? Uh, Iraqi, whatever. Iraqi were m weapons of mass destruction. I didn't remember what I was talking about. Weapons of mass destruction are a danger for us. Of course, that presupposes that they do exist. Now, that's the sort of presupposition is a problem where semanticists and pragmatists, uh, well, uh, fight about a lot, but the all recognize the phenomenon that did exist. Well, uh, <clears throat> the supposition exists in various configurations. If you say that X failed to do that, it uh, presupposes that it tried actually to. Um, well, it's a all, all other other kinds of pragmatic problems that have been addressed uh, in this conference quite a lot. With sex, I think, is <clears throat> all about metaphorical simplification. Um, Parasite must be killed, cancer must be cured, used, of course, for other domains, fallacious devices, and so on. And the question is, how can we take all these phenomena into account when dealing with discursive things, with discursive level of levels of representation, discursive structures, discursive representation, and so on? And I have a clear answer to this, because my talk is intended to be a relaxing one uh, without very strong proposal. It's just a um, prospective, uh, so to say, um, well, uh, proposal. Um, we, however, anyway, we agree, everybody agrees, well, there's no way not to agree with that, that discourses often aim and succeed at persuading, right, and at modifying the representation of the, the representations of the target audience, right? But in order to analyze influence through discourse, um, we need, I think, a theory about belief acquisition through sort of exposition to linguistic stimuli, which is utterance interpretation. So uh, the next step for pragmatics in play is to explore whether the models that we have, and that works rather okay for utterance interpretation, can extend to belief integration on one side. So there comes the need for interdisciplinary with, uh, I would say, even hardcore cognitive stuff, the acquisition. Uh, on one side, on the other side, about um, whether there is a discursive rotation that takes place uh, during a transit of protection. Well, let me skip this. <clears throat> so this, the question is whether we are speculating as hearers during online interpretation, higher level communicative intentions, so to say discursive communicative intentions. If you're not happy with the word intention, we can talk about that. The session. Um, so the question um, that um, the ordered set of representations at this point, which is a discourse. Uh, some pragmatists in Geneva uh, said yes and have uh, developed a model that expands the intention recovery in the utterance processing thing to discursive global intentions recovery. It's interesting, but it's very programmatic. Uh, that's probably needs to mind. But one thing is certainly sure, well, during utterance interpretation, we don't only interpret the utterance, we do a number of other things with possible hidden intentions, for example, that happens. Uh, we speculate about the speaker's personality, for example, that happens too, of course. We speculate about his or her skills, abilities, um, maybe about his or her benevolence towards me as a hero or as a person, right? So why wouldn't we track <laughs> all these things at the level of discourse and speculate about uh, discursive 
meanings. Now, um, okay, so the problem is how to bridge the gap, and I have no answer, but at least I, I think that both sides of the fence should recognize the import of the other, at least as a heuristic. Huh? Otherwise, the results that are, that are obtained in one side of the fence will just fall completely ignored by the other side of the fence. And so uh, science uh, lost, loses uh, anything cumulative there. And so the little sand castle on the beach without calibrating is not really what we should do, I think, in order to go on. Right? Um, Certainly, we all agree that linguistic productions, let's say discourses, are organized according to non arbitrary and according to hierarchical schemes, right? Hierarchical schemes, right? Um, now, of course, the approaches don't say the same things about this kind of organization. Uh, psychosocial approaches would say that it's more on the conventional side. Cognitive approach would say something, uh, of course, like uh, this course is a stream of representation provided by the already about. Um, but the challenge now is to uh, find a wider set of tools for the analyst, for the pragmatist, and for the discourse analyst. So, what kind of theoretical dream can we have? Uh, something, something like that. Since discursive analysis or discourse analysis takes interpretation, what we would like is probably to have meaningful discursive elements that themselves are predicted by some pragmatic theory there, and linguistic theory, of course, besides it, right? Of course, the problem remains on how we do this little uh, arrow here, uh, how we deal with that little arrow here, how we build the interface, but you know, um, since, let's say, 10 years, the big debate between uh, semanticists and pragmatists is about this interface between semantics and pragmatics, and people have started to worry about that uh, years ago, and now it comes that a lot of work has been, work has been done to understand better what goes on from the semantic representation uh, to the pragmatic representation, and I think the next program is with discursive representation, discursive things, how to interface with this uh, thing. Well, I said it's a theoretical dream, but it is very, very, very difficult. Then. So, um, as a few concluding remarks, dream, ah, uh, dream is a very uh, emotional word. Uh, I'm not dreaming about this at night, I can reassure you, reassure you. I rather, sometimes I wake up at night thinking about some micro-linguistic or semantic problem with this particular collocation, but certainly not about interfacing pragmatics with discourse analysis. Um, though, um, uh, I certainly think that critical discourse analysis should pay more attention than it does, that's my experience with uh, doing research with critical discourse analysts, and that's very fruitful, by the way. But to my opinion, it's not because I take part in it, of course, but it's very fruitful to uh, work together, and I've experienced that myself. Um, I have linguistic devices, let's say pragmatic devices, into a critical, for example, critical discourse text or problem. Um, you really enrich the result of your research, that's my opinion. Um, um, I think that I'm for a conclusion now is um, that I often noticed that some problems that came into my mind right a few minutes ago, so I could not, I will not be able probably to give you a clear example of that, but I've experienced that. Uh, some problems, for example, in uh, psychological experiments are in fact, um, um, come in fact, from, from problems at the linguistic level of shaping the questions, for example. I remember that experiment that uh, uh, was sort of like this. Uh, people were asked to complete a sentence, to add another sentence to the story. So you had a sentence, and then you should have, uh, add another sentence. It was a research about causality, and it was in French. And the problem was that the results um, were not very reliable when I saw this, this story, because the the sentence that was given to the 
um, tested persons was with um, composed past in French. The problem is that it's not about past action only, it's about the resulting situation. So you have a bias in the jet in the management of the care. So uh, attention to linguistic active things is really, I think, an import for critical discourse analysis. And of course, the reverse also is true. The more global things, when tackling things like cognitive understanding, is of great help for this process. Thank you for your attention. Hi, one. Uh, I was going back to your schema. I think about one or two slides down. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was when you talk about utterance interpretation, and I was I think one of the particularly given some of the recent of the last 15 or so years experience with text analysis done done by uh, people like Sinclair or or uh, Ohoi and and people in that tradition from Mr. Halliday and yeah. uh, tradition. What that what should we really consider to be an utterance? And because you know traditionally oh, yeah. the you know the yeah. pragmatic uh -huh. pra fragmentists have yeah. considered that just be basically a sentence that was uttered, whereas as a sort of like yeah. from holiday sense, it would probably be a yeah. whole text. It could be a whole book, according oh. to Howie. In, in 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 some sense, in some senses, I was just kind of wondering how far you think that might be worth extending. Yeah, that's a very really interesting point. It's a very classical uh, point as well. Uh, the big problem with that is, I think that you're right to say that. The problem is the problem of units. What do you take as units for your analysis, right? Um, now, uh, the, the answer that is generally provided by pragmatists and semantics is that we are working with propositional information. So basically, it's not about sentences, bits of linguistic things from which you can derivate propositional content. Right? right. So, it's, uh, if you have uh, A and B, uh, two clauses, um, two types of propositional information, you will certainly not consider the whole thing. But you, you might will, in some circumstances, <laughs> it plays a role in building complex propositions sometimes, but basically the idea is that you can have a basic propositional explicit content and you can explain, uh, you will consider this as an um, address. But uh, there's another, th another thing which is raised by your question um, which is very interesting, is probably the fact that when dealing with online processing, you certainly need to accept that uh, there is no real basic unit. Uh, what I mean is that you probably need a theory that ranges from phonological disambiguation, whatever, syntactic building online, so bits of bits of something uh, rather than uh, utterances as holes, right? Uh, I'm just wondering whether concepts, a hundred air concepts such as new, can not be enlarged pragmatically to explain the utterance sequence of one utterance. One utterance has provided a given which the following utterance developed. Considerations as well as. I'm not sure I got the question. I'm wondering if concepts such as given new, given that's what they have, which are textual concepts. Yeah. That could not be like pragmatic. Okay, uh, that's a nice question too. Um, and it, it shows uh, particularly strikingly that uh, people are talking about the same things on both parts of the fence. <laughs> uh, since given and new are things that are pretty much used, but through a different name or terminology, whether it's semantics and pragmatics, such as thematic and rhematic, or things like this, right? And it's generally a area for. Uh, pushing information into uh, levels of representation when it's pushed upside in discursive memory or things like this. So these concepts are certainly active in pragmatics. Now, uh, it's on the side of discourse analysis to see whether these kind of should um, extend within discourse analysis um, from pragmatic things provided inside pragmatics proper. Yeah, I can't answer that.
Yes. Um, depends what you count as modular approaches, because it's, uh, yes, that's factoring to, um, um, for example, roulets. I don't know if you know that as roulets. Uh, this approach, for example, assumes or says explicitly that it relies on a semantic level of representations, um, and there is a semantic module in that particular theory. Although when you ask people in the theory what that semantic module is, how does it work, uh, then you've got an answer that says for further research, or we have not chosen yet, or uh, we pick up that particular semantic or pragmatic theory and we take it as granted and then expand it. Um, besides modular approaches, that attitude we find in other trends in discourse analysis. I remember a very nice work on politeness by Watts. Um, where he uh, basically said that uh, he's interested in two discourse, but of course there is a pragmatic level of uh, transportation and all that, and this is where theorists work, and we assume that this is where the theorists work. Now that is nice, of course, I'm happy with that. But of course then uh, you see that some of the problems in the level of discourse really have sources in the pragmatic level of representation, and there lacks sort of an interface between the two. But modular analysis, modular approaches. Would it be you talk about how the rest of the application process may empower the speaker with the text? Yes. Uh, oh, uh, I'm not really sure I just point to this. Uh, if a very short session, um, if the yeah, application is a hard way to say, who has to say, uh, several services, I would say, monotone, uh, would work completely differently. Uh, for, for example, for this ending, the way they would have uh, to explain all possible and pick up on calling to do, well, consistent with the context. But relevance theory assumes that we are, go, we are going straightforwardly to the thing that seems the right thing. Um, so it's a risky procedure that made also lots of misunderstandings, of course. But the risky procedure, the police air force, is something that has been developed and um, a little bit, a very little bit yet, uh, within relevance theory to address problems of linguistic man of manipulation through discourse. Yes.